We're very happy to, to be here. I'm going to dive in because I have only 10 minutes to, to do this uh, sharing and uh, leave ample time for, for discussion. So I'd like to share a little bit about urban greenery in Singapore and do so from a nature futures perspective, um, hopefully bringing some concepts that can be applied to other cities as well. So Singapore is, of course, a very dense city, uh, similar to Hong Kong, and you may know of Singapore's greenery uh, and through some iconic projects. This is the Gardens by the Bay uh, on reclaimed land, so perhaps as an illustration of uh, this being a city very land constrained. Um, another uh, image that you may have seen and that we've seen in previous presentations actually is uh, that of uh, hotels and, and buildings downtown that are very in a very dense area but also very green so a lot of, of innovation um, in Singapore is, is very much a place that gained international recognition in terms of, of the promoting urban greenery. Um, but I'd like to share a slightly different way of thinking about uh, these uh, green cities and, and greening cities project through the lens of this nature future framework which is promoted by the intergovernmental panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services i'm assuming that most people would be familiar uh, with this uh, ipcc for ecosystem services and, and biodiversity and what this framework does um, is essentially uh, look at three different types of, of values that we uh, related to, to nature uh, and how urban greening projects may reflect one of these three values more particularly. So the first one is nature for nature, and this is very much thinking about nature for nature's sake uh, without anything to do with us humans, so more intrinsic values of nature. The second type of value is our perspective is nature for society, and this is what a lot of us refer to as ecosystem services, this idea that nature provides benefits to people. And the third one is slightly less straightforward, but try and go beyond this idea of uh, nature versus people um, by, by really thinking about how we live in synergy with, uh, with uh, nature and really trying to promote a culture whereby uh, people feel like they are stewards of urban nature, of their urban parks. Um, and in doing so, we understand that it's not about nature or us, but the, the culture that is promoted for livability, for sustainability is, is really intrinsically linked to our relationship with, uh, with urban nature. So let me give you a few examples of our projects in Singapore that illustrates this that illustrate these different types of, of values. Uh, for nature, for nature, uh, we have of course a number of nature reserves. Um, there's one uh, one of the most recent ones, Sungai Bulo, to the north of Singapore. Um, and of course, there's a recreational component to, to it, but there are also areas that are not accessible to, to people. Um, and actually, it's been protected for its high biodiversity, including um, as a, a resting place for migratory birds uh, going from all the way to Alaska, to Australia and, and New Zealand. So these are not things that Singaporeans benefit from directly, uh, but very much reflecting a, a nature for, for nature's sake perspective. Um, another example would be uh, about hornbills in, in Singapore, uh, which are birds, well, one of the conservation success stories uh, in, in Singapore, uh, where they were initiatives, they were extinct in the 19th century, and, and then there were a number of initiatives promoting um, birding and nesting sites for, for these birds, and now they're very much uh, thriving, a thriving population. Um, the Echo Bridge is also a relatively recent example. Uh, you may be familiar with the similar types of infrastructure in other cities, very important for biodiversity and connectivity between the different patches. Um, and again, an infrastructure that is purely for nature in the sense that this is not accessible to, to humans. For the second um, type of value, I mentioned these are the more traditional ecosystem services. I don't know if I should say traditional, but at least something that uh, a number of presentations before me have highlighted 
all the benefits uh, that are provided by nature to people. Um, so very often when we think about mapping these ecosystems, we can then map the ecosystem services and you, the typical result would be these, uh, these maps uh, locating where these services are provided, whether we talk about recreation, air quality, carbon sequestration, and so on and so forth. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the second half of my presentation. The third uh, type of value I mentioned is slightly less straightforward, but uh, also very important when we get to consider implementation and challenges. Uh, so as I mentioned, the idea is to really think about nature as being part of the urban planning processes and uh, part of our everyday life through promoting environmental education, uh, grassroots initiatives and top-down government initiatives uh, to promote urban gardening and really try and uh, improve this or reconnect people with, uh, with their urban nature. So that's essentially the first message uh, of this presentation that in Singapore, as in any city, there are many motivations to, to mainstream urban greenery in, in urban planning. And through this framework that I just presented, it's a way to think about why people may uh, be willing to, to promote an urban greenery agenda and, and perhaps better understand some motivations or challenges through looking at these different perspectives. The second uh, point I, I wanted to, to make um, was about ecosystem services mapping tools. Um, Steve had asked me to highlight uh, some of my experience with uh, these mapping tools as a way to elicit these motivations and co-produce information. I know this is a lot of jargon, but I'll try and explain what I mean by this. Um, so one tool that I've used uh, quite a lot and helped develop with the National Capital Project uh, is called INVEST. Um, and as you can see, it's a GIS tool that takes as inputs land use land cover maps, as well as biophysical socioeconomic data, um, and then produces some spatially explicit maps of ecosystem services. So these would produce the type of maps that I showed earlier. And very importantly, beyond the technical aspect of the tool, it, it, it's really a useful way to then come back to scenarios, so different types of land use, different types of policies, to get everyone around the table to, to think about what does it mean to promote this or that ecosystem service or to push for such or such policy. So it's really an engagement tool as much as a technical and mapping tool. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, these are the types of uh, outputs. Actually, these maps were not produced with INVEST, but there are other models. Um, in my lab, we're starting to produce a number of this information uh, for, for Singapore as well. Um, but something I want to highlight is that mapping ecosystem services potential is, is useful, but then there's the whole demand side of things. It's like whether people actually live and value these ecosystem services is another question. Uh, so we, we've talked about cooler cities or cleaner cities today. Uh, if people think this is an important service and if they live in near by an area that can provide these services, only then the, the service is what we call realized, meaning that um, it, it actually provides benefits to people. The second, uh, I guess, aspect and application of these tools is that um, they they, they are very useful for more design scale applications. And this is only just beginning uh, in, in Singapore uh, because there's really a, a huge effort to, to do to help urban planning agencies, the Urban Redevelopment Authority in, in Singapore to use these tools and, and make the metrics, the maps they produce part of their own existing workflows. And, and this is easier uh, said than, than done. And the last point uh, I'd like to add, and I was really glad to see uh, some emerging conversations uh, around the Seoul Action Plan uh, about inclusive cities, um, is that these maps are also very useful to look at uh, inequality in cities. And this is something that many, many cities around the world uh, are looking at. Uh, so we, we're starting to look at how we can compute these environmental justice or injustice indicators. Uh, and, and these tools are very useful to, to do so. 
Um, one last example I'll present is uh, these maps that we produced for a Paris uh, case study uh, last year. Um, and that essentially show that if you focus on green space access, you would target and increase the uh, greening projects in these yellow areas on, on this uh, GIF. Um, if you want to reduce inequalities, you would actually focus on these red areas, uh, meaning that if you take into account both access to green space and income as a very simple proxy for um, the ability for people to actually get substitutes for, for these services. Uh, so this is just a way to illustrate that these matter and you would not make the same policy decisions uh, if you looked at one metric or, or the other. So if you'd like to learn a bit more about the invest tools, there's a recent paper um, that we published with the additional case studies and that presents the philosophy of the invest model as well. So feel free to, to take a look at, at this. Um, and for now, I'll just conclude by um, reminding you of the two main points for this presentation. The first one was that there are many motivations to mainstream urban greenery in urban planning. So I presented the Nature Futures framework to, as a tool to help make sense of them. Um, and then this idea that ecosystem services mapping tools help elicit this motivation. And they're, they're really a useful tool to co-produce information with many different stakeholders to implement greenery projects. So with that, I will hand it back up to Steve and, and uh, happy to take any questions.